Chapter 2 The Cargo of Rice The wolf was in among the sheep. The tossing grey water of the Bay of Biscay was dotted with white sails as far as the eye could see, and although a strong breeze was blowing, every vessel was under perilously heavy canvas. Every ship but one was trying to escape. The exception was His Majesty's frigate Indefatigable, Captain Sir Edward Pellew. Farther out in the Atlantic, hundreds of miles away, a great battle was being fought, where the ships of the line were thrashing out the question as to whether England or France should wield the weapon of sea power. Here, in the bay, the convoy which the French ships were intended to escort was exposed to the attack of a ship of prey at liberty to capture any ship she could overhaul. She had come surging up from leeward, cutting off all chance of escape in that direction and the clumsy merchant ships were forced to beat to windward. They were all filled with the food revolutionary France, her economy disordered by the convulsion through which she was passing, was awaiting so anxiously, and their crews were all anxious to escape confinement in an English prison. Ship after ship was overhauled. A shot or two, and the new fangled tricolour came fluttering down from the gaff, and a prize crew was hurriedly sent on board to conduct the captive to an English port while the frigate da dra dashed after fresh prey. On the quarter-deck of the indefatigable, Pellow fumed over each necessary delay. The convoy, each ship as close to the wind as she would lie, and under all sail she could carry, was slowly scattering, spreading farther and farther with the passing minutes, and some of these would find safety in mere dispersion if any time was wasted. Pellew did not wait to pick up his boat. At each surrender he merely ordered away an officer and an armed guard, and the moment the prize crew was on its way he filled his main topsail again and hurried off after the next victim. The brig they were pursuing at the moment was slow to surrender. The long nine-pounders in the indefatigable's bows bellowed out more than once. On that heaving sea it was not so easy to aim accurately and the brig continued on her course, hoping for some miracle to save her. Very well, snapped Pellew. He's asked for it, let him have it! The gun layers of the bow chasers changed their point of aim, firing at the ship instead of across her bows. Not into the hull, damn it! shouted Pellew. One shot had struck the brig perilously close to a waterline. Cripple her! The next shot by luck or by judgment was given better elevation. The slings of the fore topsail yard were shot away, the reef sail came down, the yard hanging lopsidedly, and the brig came up into the wind for the indefatigable to heave to close beside her, her broadside ready to fire into her. Under the threat under that threat, a flag came down. What's that? What brig's that? shouted Pellew through his megaphone. Uh, Marie Gallant of Bordeaux, translated the officer beside Pellew, as the French captain made reply. Uh, Twenty-four days out from New Orleans with rice. Rice, said Pellew. <laughs> That'll sell for a pretty penny when we get her back home. Two hundred tons, I should say. Twelve of a crew at most. She'll meet a prize crew of four, a midshipman's command. He looked round him as though for, uh, for inspiration before giving his next order. Mr. Hornblower, sir, take four men of the cutter's crew and board that brig. Mr. Soames will give you our position. Take her into any English port you can make and report there for orders. Aye, aye, sir. Hornblower was at his station at the starboard quarter-deck carronades, which was perhaps how he had caught Pellew's eye, his dirk at his side and a pistol in his belt. It was a moment for fast thinking, for anybody could see Pellew's impatience. With the indefatigable cleared for action, his sea chest would be part of the surgeon's operating table down below, so that there was no chance of getting any, any anything out of it. He would have to leave just as he was. The cutter was even now clawing up to position on the indefatigable's quarter, so he ran to the ship's side and hailed her, trying to make his voice sound as big and as manly as he could, and at the word of the lieutenant in command, she turned her bows towards the frigate. "'Here's our latitude and longitude, Mr. Hornblower,' said Soames, the master, handing a scrap of paper to him. "'Thank you,' said Hornblower, shoving it into his pocket." He scrambled awkwardly into the mizzen chains and looked down into the cutter. Ship and boat were pitching together, almost bows onto the sea, and the distance between them looked appallingly great. 
The bearded seaman, standing in the bows, could only just reach up to the chains with his long boat hook. Hornblower hesitated for a long second. He knew that he was ungainly and awkward. Book learning was of no use when it came to jumping into a boat. But he had to make the leap, for Pellew was fuming behind him, and the eyes of the boat crew and the whole ship's company were upon him. Better to jump and hurt himself. Better to jump and make an, an exhibition of himself than to delay the ship. Waiting was certain failure, while he still had a choice if he jumped. Perhaps at a word from Pellew, the indefatigable's helmsman allowed the ship's head to fall from the sea a little. A somewhat diagonal wave lifted the indefatigable's stern and then passed on, so that the cutter's bows rose as the ship's stern sank a trifle. Hornblower braced himself and leaped. His feet reached the gunwale, and he tottered there for one indescribable second. A seaman grabbed the breast of his jacket, and he fell forward rather than backward. Not even the stout arm of the seaman, fully extended, could hold him up, and he pitched head foremost, legs in the air, upon the hands of the second thwart. He cannoned onto their bodies, knocking the breath out, uh, out of his own against their muscular shoulders, and finally struggled into an upright position. <coughs> I'm sorry, he gasped to the men who had broken his fall. Never you mind, sir, said the, said the nearest one, a real tarry sailor, tattooed and pigtailed. You're only a featherweight. The lieutenant in command was looking at him from the stern sheets. Would you go to the brig, please, sir, he asked, and the lieutenant bawled an order, and the cutter swung round as Hornblower made his way aft. It was a pleasant surprise not to be received with the broad grins of a tolerantly concealed amusement. Boarding a small boat from a big frigate, even in even a moderate sea, was no easy matter. Probably every man on board had arrived headfirst at some time or other, and it was not in the tradition of the service, as understood in the indefatigable, to laugh at a man who did his best without shirking. "'Are you taking charge of the brig?' asked the lieutenant. "'Yes, sir. The captain told me to take four of your men.' Well, "'They'd better be top men, then,' said the lieutenant, casting his eyes aloft at the rigging of the brig." The fore topsail yard was hanging precariously, and the jib halyard had slacked off, so that the sail was flapping thunderously in the wind. Uh, do you know these men, or shall I pick them for you? Uh, I'd be obliged if you would, sir. The lieutenant shouted four names, and four men replied. Keep them away from the drink, and they'll be all right, said the lieutenant. Watch the French crew. They'll recapture the ship and have you in a French jail before you can say Jack Robinson if you don't. Aye, aye, sir, said Hornblower. The cutter surged alongside the brig, white water creaming between the two vessels. The tattooed sailor hastily concluded a bargain with another man on his thwart and pocketed a lump of tobacco. The men were leaving their possessions behind, just like Hornblower, and sprang for the main chains. Another man followed with him, and they stood and waited while Hornblower, with difficulty, made his way forward along the plunging boat. He stood balancing precariously on the forward th thwart. The main chains of the brig were far lower than the mizzen chains of the indefatigable, but this time he had to jump upwards. One of the seamen steadied him with an arm on his shoulder. Wait for it, sir, he said. Get ready. Now jump, sir. Hornblower hurled himself forward, all arms and legs, like a leaping frog at the main chains. His hands reached the shrouds, but his knees slipped off, and the brig, rolling, lowered him thigh deep into the sea as the shrouds slipped through his hands. But the waiting seaman grabbed his wrists and hauled him on board and two more seamen followed him. He led the way onto the deck. The first sight to meet his eyes was a man seated on the hatch cover, his head thrown back, holding to his mouth a bottle, the bottom pointing straight up at the sky. He was one of a large group, all sitting round the hatch cover. There were more bottles in evidence. One was passed by one man to another as he looked, and as he approached, a roll of the ship brought an empty bottle rolling past his toes to clatter into the scuppers. Another of the group, with white hair blowing in the wind, rose to welcome him, and stood for a moment with waving arms and rolling eyes, bracing himself as though to say something of immense importance, and seeking earnestly for the right words to use. "'God damn English!' it was what he finally said, and then having said it, he sat down with a bump on the hatch cover, and from a seated position proceeded to lie down and compose himself to sleep with his head on his arms." They've made the best of their time, sir, by the holy, said the seaman at Hornblower's elbow. <laughs> Wish we were as happy, said another. 
A case, still a quarter full of bottles, each elaborately sealed, stood on the deck beside the hatch cover, and the seaman picked out a bottle to look at it curiously. Hornblower did not need to remember the lieutenant's warning. On his shore excursions with press gangs, he had already had his experience of the British seaman's tendency to drink. His boarding party would be as drunk as the Frenchman in half an hour if he allowed it. A frightful mental picture of himself, drifting into the Bay of Biscay with a disabled ship and a drunken crew, rose in his mind and filled him with anxiety. Put that down, he ordered. The urgency of the situation made his 17-year-old voice crack like a 14-year-old's, and the seaman hesitated holding the bottle in his hand. Put it down, do you hear? said Hornblower, desperate with worry. This was his first independent command. Conditions were absolutely novel, and excitement brought out all the passion of his mercurial temperament, while at the same time, the more calculating part of his mind told him that if he were not obeyed now, he never would be. His pistol was in his belt, and he put his hand on the butt, and it is conceivable that he would have drawn it and used it, if the priming had not got wet, he said to himself bitterly, when he thought about the incident later on. But the seaman, with one more glance at him, put the bottle back into the case. The incident was closed, and it was time for the next step. Take these men forward, he said, giving the obvious order. Throw them into the forecastle. Aye, aye, sir. Most of the Frenchmen could still walk, but three were dragged by their collars, while the British herded the others before them. Come along, ye, said one of the Frenchmen. This is way, eh? He evidently believed that a Frenchman would understand him better if he spoke like that. The Frenchman, who had greeted their arrival now, awakened, and suddenly, realising he was being dragged forward, broke away and turned to Ormblower. I officer, he said, pointing to himself. I not go with them. Take him away, said Hornblower. In his tense condition, he could not stop, stop to debate trifles. He dragged the case of bottles down to the ship's side and pitched them overboard two at a time. Obviously, it was a wine of some special vintage, which the Frenchman had decided to drink before the English could get their hands on it. But that weighed not at all with Hornblower, for a British seaman could get drunk on vintage claret just as easily as upon service rum. The task was finished before the last of the Frenchmen disappeared into the forecastle, and Hornblower had time to look about him. The strong ble breeze blew confusingly round his ears, and the ceaseless thunder of the flapping jib made it hard to think as he looked at the ruin aloft. Every sail was flat aback. The brig was moving jerkily, gathering sternway for a space before her untended rudder threw round to spill the wind and bring her up again like a jibbing horse. His mathematical mind had already plenty of experience with a well-handled ship, and the delicate adjustments between after sails and headsails. Here, the balance had been disturbed and Hornblower was at work on the problem of forces acting on plain surfaces when his men came trooping back to him. One thing at least was certain, and that was that the precariously hanging foretopsail yard would tear itself free to do all sorts of unforeseeable damage if it was tossed about much more. This ship must be properly hove to, and Hornblower could guess how to set, it, set about it, and he formulated the order in his mind, just in time to avoid any appearance of hesitation. Brace the after yards to larboard, he said. Man the braces, men. They obeyed him, while he himself went gingerly to the wheel. He had served a few tricks as helmsman, learning his professional duties under Pellew's orders, but he did not feel happy about it. The spokes felt foreign to his fingers as he took hold. He spun the wheel experimentally, but timidly. But it was easy. With the after yards braced round, the brig rolled more comfortably at once and the spokes told their own story to his sensitive fingers, as the ship became a thing of logical construction again. Hornblower's mind completed the solution of the problem of the effect of the rudder at the same time as his senses solved it empirically. The wheel could be safely lashed, he knew, in these conditions, and he slipped the, beck uh, the becket over the spoke and stepped away from the wheel with the Marie Gallant riding comfortably and taking the seas on her starboard bow. The seaman took his competence gratifyingly for granted, but Hornblower, looking at the tangle on the foremast, had not the remotest idea of how to deal with the next problem. He was not even sure about what was wrong, but the hands under his orders were seamen of vast experience, who must have dealt with similar emergencies a score of times. The first, indeed the only thing to do, was to delegate his responsibility. "'Who's the oldest seaman among you?' he demanded. 
His determination not to quaver made him curt. Matthew, sir, said someone at length, indicating with his thumb his, the pigtailed and tattooed seaman upon whom he had fallen in the cutter. Uh, very well, then, I'll rate you petty officer, Matthews. Get to work at once and clear that raffle away for it. I'll be busy hereafter. It was a nervous moment for Hornblower, but Matthews put his knuckles to his forehead. Aye, aye, sir, he said, quite as a matter of course. Get that jib in first before it flogs itself to pieces, said Hornblower, greatly emboldened. Aye, aye, sir. Carry on, then. The seamen, the seamen turned to go forward, and Hornblower walked aft. aft. He took the telescope from its becket on the poop and swept the horizon. There were a few sails in sight. The nearest ones he could recognise as prizes, which, all with all sails set that they could carry, were heading for England as fast as they could go. <clears throat> Far away to windward, he could see the indefatigable's topsails as she clawed after the rest of the convoy. She had already overhauled and captured all the slower and less wealthier vessels, so that each succeeding chase would be longer. Soon, he would be alone on this wide sea, three hundred miles from England. Three hundred miles, two days with a fair wind, but how long if the wind turned foul? He replaced the telescope. The men were already had hard at work for it, so he went below and looked round the neat cabins of the officers. Two single ones for the captain and the mate, presumably, and a double one for the boatswain and the cook or the carpenter. He found the lazarette, identifying it by the miscellaneous stores within it. The door was swinging to and fro with a bunch of keys dangling. The French captain, faced with the loss of all he possessed, had not even troubled to lock the door again after taking out the case of wine. Hornblower locked the door and put the keys in his pocket and felt suddenly lonely. His first experience of the loneliness of the man in command at sea. He went on deck again, and at the sight of him, Matthews hurried aft and knuckled his forehead. Beg pardon, sir, but we'll have to use the jeers to sling that yard again. Very good. Well, we'll need more hands than we have, sir. And I'll put some of they Frenchies to work. If you think they can. If any of them are sober enough. I think I can, sir, drunk or sober. Very good. It was that moment that Hornblower remembered with bitter self-reproach that the priming of his pistol was probably wet, and that he had not scorn enough for himself at having put his trust in a pistol without re-priming after evolutions in the small boat. While, Math while Matthews went forward, he dashed below again. There was a case of pistols, which he remembered having seen in the captain's cabin, with a powder flask and bullet bag hanging beside it. He loaded both weapons and reprimed his own, and came again on deck with three pistols in his belt, just as his men appeared from the forecastle, herding a half a dozen Frenchmen. He posed himself in the poop, straddling with his hands behind his back, trying to adopt an air of magnificent indifference and understanding. With the jeers taking the weight of the yard and sail, an hour's hard work resulted in the yard being slung again and the sail reset. When the work was advancing toward completion, Hornblower came to himself again to remember that in a few minutes he would have to set a course, and he dashed below again to set out the chart and the dividers and parallel rulers. From his pocket, he extracted the crumpled scrap of paper with his position on it. He had thrust it in there so carelessly a little while back, at a time when the immediate problem before him was to transfer himself from the indefatigable to the cutter. It made him unhappy to think of how cavalierly he had treated that scrap of paper. He then began to, began to feel that a life in the Navy although it seemed to move from one crisis to another, was really one continuous crisis, that even while dealing with one emergency, it was necessary to be making plans to deal with the next. He bent over the chart and plotted his position, and laid off his course. It was a queer, uncomfortable feeling to think that what had up to this moment been an academic exercise, conducted under the reassuring supervision of Mr. Soames, was now something on which he hinged his life and reputation. He checked his working, decided upon his course, and wrote it down on a scrap of paper for fear he should forget it. So when the fore topsail yard was re-slung, and the prisoners herded back into the forecastle, and Matthews looked to him for further orders, he was ready. We'll square away, he said. Matthews, send a man to the wheel. He, he himself gave a hand at the braces. The wind had moderated, and he felt his men could handle the brig under her present sail. What course, sir? asked the man at the wheel, and Hornblower dived into his pocket for his scrap of paper. 
Nor east by north, he said, reading it out. Nor east by north, sir, said the helmsman, and the Marie Gallant, running free, set her course for England. Night was closing in by now, and all around the circle of the horizon there was not a sail in sight. There must be plenty of ships just over the horizon, he knew. But that did not do much to ease his feelings of loneliness as darkness came on. There was so much to do, so much to bear in mind, and all the responsibility lay upon his unaccustomed shoulders. The prisoners had to be battened down in the forecastle. A watch had to be set. There was even the trivial matter of hunting up flint and steel to light the binnacle lamp. A hand on forward as a lookout, who could also keep an eye on the prisoners below, a hand aft at the wheel, two hands snatching some sleep, knowing that to get in any sail would be an all-hands job, a hasty meal of water from the scuttlebutt, and of biscuit from the cabin stores in the lazarette, a constant eye to be kept on the weather. Hornblower paced the deck in the darkness. "'Why don't you get some sleep, sir?' asked the man on the wheel. "'I will later on, Hunter,' said Hornblower." trying not to allow his tone to reveal the fact that such a thing had never occurred to him. He knew it was sensible advice, and he actually tried to follow it, retiring below to fling, to fling himself down on the captain's cot. But of course he could not sleep. When he heard the lockout, the lookout bawling, bawling down the companionway to rouse the other two hands to relieve the watch, they were asleep in the cabin next to him, he could not prevent himself from getting up again and coming on deck to see that all was well. With Matthews in charge... He felt he should not be anxious, and he drove himself below again, but he had hardly fallen onto the cot again when a new thought brought him to his feet again, his skin cold with anxiety, and a prodigious self-contempt vying with the anxiety for first glance at his emotions. He rushed on deck and walked forward to where Matthews was squatting by the nightheads. "'Nothing's been done to see if the brig is taking in any water,' he said." He had hardly worked out the wording of that sentence during his walk forward, so as to cast no aspersion on Matthews, and yet at the same time, for the sake of discipline, attributing no blame to himself. That's so, sir. One of those shots fired by the indefatigable Holder, went on Hornblower. What damage did it do? I don't rightly know, sir. I was in the cutter at the time. Well, we must look as soon as it's light. And we better, said Hornblower, and we better sound the well now. Those were brave words. During his rapid course of seamanship aboard the Indefatigable, Hornblower had had a little instruction everywhere, working under the orders of every head of every department in rotation. Once he had been with the carpenter, when he sounded the well. Whether he could find the well in this ship and sound it, he did not know. Aye, aye, sir, said Matthews without hesitation, and he strolled aft to the pump. Uh, you'll need a light, sir, I'll get you one. When he came back with the lantern, he shone it upon the coiled sounding line hanging hanging beside the pump, so that Hornblower recognised it at once. He lifted down, inserted a three-foot weighted rod into the aperture of the well, and then remembered in time to take it out again and make sure the well was dry. Then he let it drop again, paying out the line until he felt the rod strike the ship's bottom with a satisfactory thud. He hauled out the line again, and Matthews held the lantern as Hornblower, with some trepidation, brought out the timber to examine it. Not a drop, sir. Dry as yesterday's pannikin. Hornblower was agreeably surprised. Any ship he had ever served of, served of, or any ship he had ever heard of, leaked to a certain extent. Even in the well-found indefatigable, pumping had been necessary every day. He did not know whether this dryness was a very remarkable phenomenon, or just simply a remarkable one. He wanted to be both non-committal and imperturbable. Mm-hmm, was the comment he eventually produced. Very good, Matthews. Coil that line again. The knowledge that the Marie Gallant was making no water at all might have encouraged him to sleep if the wind had not chosen to veer steadily and strengthen itself some uh, soon after he retired again. It was Matthews who came down and pounded on his door with the unwelcome news. We can't keep this course to your set much longer, sir, concluded Matthews, and the wind's coming gusty-like. Very good, I'll be up. Call all hands, said Hornblower, with a testiness that might have been the result of a sudden awakening, if it had not really disguised his inner quaverings. With, with such a small crew, he dare not run the slightest risk of being taken by surprise by the weather. Nothing could be done in a hurry, as he soon found. He had to take the wheel while his four hands laboured at reefing the topsails and snugging the brig down. The task took half the night, 
and by the time it was finished, it was quite plain, with the wind steering northerly, the Morigaland could not steer northeast by north any longer. Hornblower gave up the wheel and went below to the chart, but what he saw there only confirmed the pessimistic decision he had already reached by me mental calculation. As close to the wind as they could lie on this tack, they could not weather Ushant. Short-handed as he was, he did not dare continue in the hope that the wind might back. All his reading and all his instruction had warned him of the terrors of a lee shore. There was nothing for it but to go about. He returned to the deck with a heavy heart. All hands, wear ship, he said, trying to bellow with the order in the manner of Mr. Bolton, the third lieutenant of the indefatigable. They brought the brig safely round, and she took up her new course, close hold on the starboard tack. Now she was heading away from the dangerous shores of France, without a doubt, but she was heading nearly as directly away from the friendly shores of England. Gone was all hope of an easy two-day run to England. Gone was any hope of sleep that night for Hornblower. During the year before he joined the Navy, Hornblower had attended classes given by a penniless French émigré in French, music, and dancing. Early enough, the wretched émigré had found that Hornblower had no ear for music whatsoever, which made it impossible to teach him to dance, and so he had endeavoured to earn good his fee by concentrating on French. A good deal of what he taught Hornblower had found a permanent resting place in Hornblower's tenacious memory. He had never thought that it would be of much use to him, but he discovered on the contrary when the French captain at dawn insisted on an interview with him. The Frenchman had little English, but it was a present surprise to Hornblower to find they actually could get along better in French as soon as he could fight down his shyness sufficiently to produce the halting words. The captain drank he uh, thirstily from the scuttlebutt. His cheeks were, of course, unshaven, and he wore a bleary look after twelve hours in a crowded forecastle where he had been battened down there three parts drunk. My men are hungry, said the captain. He did not look hungry himself. Mine also, said Hornblower. I also. It was natural when one spoke French to gesticulate, to indicate his men with a wave of the hand and himself with a tap on the chest. I have a cook, said the captain. It took some time to arrange the terms of a truce. The Frenchmen were to be allowed on deck, the cook was to provide food for everyone on board, and while these amenities were permitted until noon, the French would make no attempt to take the ship. Bon said the captain at length, and when Hornblower had given the necessary orders per permitting the release of the crew, he shouted for the cook and entered into an urgent discussion regarding dinner. Soon, smoke was issuing satisfactorily from the galley chimney. Then the captain looked up at the grey sky, at the close reef topsails, and glanced into the binnacle of the compass. A foul wind for England, he remarked. Yes, said Hornblower shortly. Did not want this Frenchman to guess at his trepidation and bitterness. The captain seemed to be feeling the motion of the brig under his feet with attention. Uh, she rides a little heavily, does she not? he said. Perhaps, said Hornblower. He was not at all familiar with the Marie Gallant, nor with ships at all, and he had no opinion on the subject, but he was not going to reveal his ignorance. Does she leak? asked the captain. There's no water in her, said Hornblower. Ah, but you would find none in the well. We are carrying a cargo of rice, you must remember. Yes, said Hornblower. He found it very hard at this moment to remain outwardly unperturbed, as his mind grasped the implications of what was being said to him. Rice would absorb every water, every drop of water taken in by the ship, so that no leak would be apparent on sounding the well. And yet every drop of water taken in would deprive her of that much buoyancy all the same. One shot from your cursed frigate struck us in the hull. Of course you have investigated this damage, we? Of course, said Hornblower, lying bravely. But as soon as he had a private conversation with Matthews on the point, Matthews looked instantly grave. Where did the shot hit her, sir? he asked. Somewhere on the port side forward, I should judge. He and Matthews craned their necks over the ship's side. Can't see nothing, sir. Lower me over the side in a bowline, I'll find what I can. Hornblower was about to agree, and then changed his mind. I'll go over the side myself, he said. He could not analyse the motives which impelled him to say that. Partly, he wanted to see things with his own eyes. Partly, 
He was influenced by the doctrine that he should never give an order he was not prepared to obey himself. But mostly, it must have been the desire to impose a penance upon himself for his negligence. Matthews and Carson put a bowline round him and lowered him over. He found himself dangling against the ship's side, with the sea bubbling just below him. As the ship pitched, the sea came up to meet him, and he was wet to the waist within the first five seconds, and as the ship rolled, he was alternatively swung away from the side and bumped against it. The men with the line walked steadily aft, giving him the chance to examine the whole side of the brig above water, and there was not a shot hole to be seen. He said as much to Matthews when they hauled him on deck. Then it's just below the waterline, sir, said Matthews, saying just what was in Hornblower's mind. You're sure the shot hit her, sir? Yes, I'm sure, snapped Hornblower. Lack of sleep and worry and a sense of guilt were all shortening his temper, and he had to speak sharply or break down in tears. But he had already decided upon his next move. He had made up his mind about that while they were hauling him up. We'll have to heave her to on the other tack and try again, he said. On the other tack, the ship would incline over to the other side, and the shot hole, if indeed there was one, would not be so deeply submerged. Hornblower stood with the water dripping from his clothes as they wore the, the brig round. The wind was keen and cold, but he was shivering with expectancy rather than cold. The heeling of the brig laid him much more definitely against the side, and they lowered him until his legs were scraping over the marine growths which he carried there between wind and water. They then walked aft with, with him, dragging him along the side of the ship, and just abaft the foremast he found what he was seeking. Avast there! he yelled up onto the deck, mastering the sick despair that he felt. The motion of the bowline along the ship ceased. Lower away! Another two feet! Now he was waist-deep in the water, and when the brig swayed, the water closed briefly over his head like a momentary death. Here it was, two feet below the waterline. Even with the brig hove to on this tack, a splintered, jagged hole, square rather than round, and a foot across. As the sea boiled round him, Hornblower even fancied he could hear it bubbling into the ship, but then that might be pure fancy. He hailed the deck for him to haul him up again, and they stood eagerly listening for what he had to say. Two feet below the waterline, sir. She was close hauled and heaving right over, of course, when we hit her, but her bows must have lifted just as we fired. And now she's lower, and of course now she's lower in the water now. That was the point. Whatever they did now, however much they healed her, that hole would be under water. And on the other tack, it would be far under water, with much additional pressure. Yet on the present tack, they were headed for France. And the more water they took in, the lower the brig would settle, and the greater would be the pressure forcing the water in through the hole. Something must be done to plug the leak, and Hornblower's reading of the manuals of seamanship told him precisely what it was. We must father a sail and get it over that hole, he announced. Call those Frenchmen over. To father a sail was to make something like a vast, hairy doormat out of it, by threading innumerable lengths of half-unfurled ravel line through it. When this was done, the sail would be lowered below the ship's bottom and placed against the hole. The inward pressure would then force the hairy mass so tightly against the hole that the entrance of water would be made at least much more difficult. The Frenchmen were not so quick to help in the task. It was no longer their ship, and they were heading for an English prison, so that even with their lives at stake they were somewhat apathetic. It took time to get out a new Tagalog sail. Hornblower felt that the stouter the canvas the better, and to set a party to work cutting lengths of line, threading them through and unravelling them. The French captain looked at them, squatting on the deck, all at work. Five years I spent in a prison hulk in Portsmouth during the last war, he said. Five years. Yes, said Hornblower. He might have felt sympathy, but he was not only preoccupied with his own problems, but he was also numb with the cold. He had not only here, he only had every intention, if possible, of escorting the French captain to England and to prison again, but he also had, at that very moment, intended to go down below and appropriate some of his spare clothing. Down below, it seemed to Hornblower, as if the noises all about him, the creaks and groans of the wooden ship at sea, were more pronounced than usual. The brig was riding easily enough now, hove too, and yet the bulkheads down below were cracking and creaking as if the brigates were racking herself to pieces in a storm. 
He dismissed the notion as a product of his overstimulated imagination, but by the time he had toweled himself into something like warmth and put on the captain's best suit, it recurred to him. The brig was groaning as if in stress. He came on deck again to see how the working party was progressing. Although he'd hardly been on deck two minutes when one of the Frenchmen, reaching back for another length of line, stopped in his movement to stare at the deck. He picked at a deck seam, looked up, and caught Hornblower's eye, and called to him. Hornblower made no pretense of understanding the words. The gestures explained themselves. The deck seam was opening a little. The pitch was bulging out of it. Hornblower looked at the phenomenon without understanding it. Only a foot or two of the seam was open, and the rest of the deck seemed solid enough. No! Now that his attention was called to it, and he looked further, there were one or two other places in the deck where the pitch had risen in ridges out from out the seams. It was something beyond his limited experience, even beyond his extensive reading. But the French captain was at his side, staring at the rice too. Mon Dieu, he said, the rice, the rice! The French word uh, rice that he used was unknown to Hornblower, but he stamped his foot on the deck and pointed down through it. The cow go! It grows! It grows bigger! Matthews was with them now, and without understanding a word of French, he understood. Didn't I hear this brig was full of rice, sir? Yes. That's it, then. The water's got in and it's swelling. So it would. Dry rice soaked in water and would double or treble its volume. The cargo was swelling and bursting the seams of the ship open. Hornblower remembered the unnatural creaks and groans below. It was a black moment. He looked round at the unfriendly sea for inspiration and support, finding neither. Several seconds passed before he was ready to speak, and ready to maintain the dignity of a naval officer in the face of difficulty. But the sooner we get that sail over the hole, the, hole, the better then, he said. It was, too much, it was too much to be expected that his voice should sound natural. Hurry those Frenchmen up. He turned to pace the deck so as to allow his feelings to subside and to set his thoughts running in an again orderly fashion. But the French captain was at his elbow, voluble as, a, as Job's comforter. I thought I said the ship was riding heavily, he said. She's lower in the water. Go to the devil, said Hornblower in English. He cannot even think up the French for that phrase. Even as he stood, he felt a sudden sharp shock beneath his feet, as if somebody had hit the deck beneath them with a mallet. The ship was springing apart, bit by bit. Hurry with that sail there, he yelled, yelled, turning back to the working party, and then was angry with himself because the tone of his voice must have betrayed undignified agitation. At last, an area of five feet square of the sail was followed. Lines were roved through the grommets, and the working party hurried forward to work the sail under the brig and drag it aft to the hole. Hornblower was taking off his clothes, not out of regard for the captain's property, but so as to keep them dry for himself. I'll go over and see that it's in place, he said. Matthews, get a bowline ready for me. Naked and wet, it seemed to him as if the wind blew clear through him. Rubbing against the ship's side as she rolled, he lost a good deal of skin, and the waves passing down the ship smacked at him with boisterous lack of consideration. But he saw the fothered sail placed against the hole, and with intense satisfaction he saw the hairy mass suck into position, dimpling over the hole to form a deep hollow so that he could be sure that the hole was plugged solid. They hauled him up again when he hailed and awaited his orders. He stood, naked, stupid with the cold and fatigue and lack of sleep, struggling to form his next decision. Lay her on the stab attack, he said at length. If the brig were going to sink, it hardly mattered if it were 100 or 200 miles from the French coast. If she were to stay afloat, he wanted to be well clear of that lee shore and the chance of recapture. The shot hole with its fathered sail would be deeper underwater to increase the risk, but it seemed to be the best chance. The French captain saw them making preparations to wear the brig round, and turned upon Hornblower with voluble protests. With this wind, they could make Bordeaux easily on the other tack. Hornblower was risking all their lives, he said. Into Hornblower's numb mind crept uninvited, the translation of something he had previously wanted to say. He could use it now. Allez au diable, he snapped, 
as he put on the Frenchman's stout woolen shirt on over his head. With his head emerged, when his head emerged, the Frenchman was still protesting volubly, so violently indeed, that a new doubt came into Hornblower's mind. A, ma a word to Matthew sent him round the, fre the French prisoners to search for weapons. There was nothing to be found except the sailors' knives, but as a matter of precaution, Hornblower had them all impounded, and when he dressed, he went to special trouble with his three pistols, drawing afresh the charges from them and reloading and repriming them again. Three pistols in his belt looked positively piratical, and, and as though he was still young enough to be playing imaginative games. But Hornblower felt in his bones that there might be a time when the Frenchmen might try to rise against their captors, and three pistols would not be too many against twelve desperate men who had makeshift weapons ready to hand, belaying pins and the like. Matthews was awaiting him with a long face. Sir, he said, begging your pardon, but I don't like the looks of it. Straight I don't. I don't like the feel of her. She's settling down and she's opening up, and I'm certain sure. Beg your pardon, sir, for saying so. Down below, Hornblower had heard the fabric of the ship continuing to crack and complain. Up here, the deck seams were gaping more widely. It was very likely an explanation. The swelling of the rice must have forced open the ship's seams below the water, so that plugging the shot hole would only have eliminated what would be by now only a minor, a minor leak. Water must be pouring in, the cargo still swelling, opening up the ship like an overblown floor. Ships were built to withstand blows from without, and there was nothing about their construction to resist an outward pressure. Wider and wider would gape the seams, and faster and faster the sea would gain access to the cargo. Look ye there, sir, said Matthew suddenly. In the broad light of day, a small grey shape was hurrying along the weather scuppers. Another one followed it, and another after that. Rats! Something convulsive must be going on down below to bring them on deck in daytime from out their comfortable nests among unlimited food of the cargo. The pressure must be enormous. Hornblower felt another small shock beneath his feet at that moment, as something further parted beneath them. But there was one more card to play, one last line of defence that he could think of. I'll jettison the cargo, said Hornblower. He had never uttered that word in his life, but he had read it. Get the prisoners and we'll start. The batten down hatch cover was domed upwards, curiously and significantly, as the wedges were knocked out, one plank tore loose at one end with a crash, pointing diagonally downwards, and as the working party lifted off the cover, a brown form followed it upwards. A bag of rice, forced out by the underlying pressure until it jammed in the hatchway. Tail on those tackles and sway it up, called Hornblower. Bag by bag, the rice was hauled up from the hold. Sometimes the bag split, allowing a torrent of rice to pour onto the deck, but that did not matter. Another section of the working party swept rice and bags to the lee side and into the ever-hungry sea. After the first three bags, the difficulties increased, for the cargo was so tightly jammed below that it called for enormous force to tear each bag out of its position. Two men had to go down the hatchway to pry the bags loose and adjust the slings. There was a momentary hesitation on the part of the two Frenchmen to whom Hornblower pointed. The bags might not all be jammed, and the hold of a tossing ship was a dangerous place wherein a roll might bury them alive. But Hornblower had no thought of that moment for other people's human fears. He scowled at the brief check, and they hastened to lower themselves down the hatchway. The labour was enormous, as it went on hour by hour. The men at the tackles were dripping with sweat and drooping with fatigue, but they had to relieve periodically the men below, for the bags had jammed themselves in tears, pressed hard against the ship's bottom below and the deck beams above, and when the bags immediately below the hatchway had been swayed up, the surrounding ones had to be pried loose, out of each tier. Then, when a small clearance had been made in the neighbourhood of the hatchway, they were getting deeper down into the hold. They made the inevitable discovery. The lower tiers of the bags had been wetted. Their contents had swelled and the bags had burst. The lower half of the hold was packed solid with damp rice, which could only be got out with shovels and a hoist. The still intact bags of the upper tiers, farther away from the hatchway, were still jammed tight, calling for much labour to free them and to manhandle them under the hatchway to be hoisted out. Hornblower, facing the problem, was distracted by a touch on his elbow when Matthews came up to speak. 
It ain't no go, sir, said Matthews. She's a lower in the water and settling fast. Hornblower walked to the ship's side with him and looked over. There could be no doubt about it. He had been over the side himself and could remember the height of the water line, and he had, for a more exact guide, the level of the fothered sail under the ship's bottom. The brig was a full six inches lower in the water, and this after fifty tons of rice at least had been hoisted out and flung over the side. The brig must be leaking like a basket, with water pouring in through the gaping seams to be sucked up immediately by the thirsty rice. Hornblower's left hand was hurting him, and he looked down to discover that he was gripping the rail with it so tightly as to cause him pain without knowing what he was doing. He released his grip and looked about him at the afternoon sun, at the tossing sea. He did not want to give in and admit defeat. The French captain came up to him. Monsieur, this is folly! Madness, monsieur! My men are overcome by fatigue! Over by the hatchway, Hornblower saw Hunter was driving the French seamen to their work with a rope's end, which he was using furiously. There was not much more work to be got out of the Frenchman, and at that moment the Marie Gallant rose heavily to a wave and wallowed down the further side. Even his inexperience could detect the sluggishness and ominous deadness of her movements. This brig had not much longer to float, and there was a good deal to do. I shall make preparations for abandoning ship, Matthews, he said. He poked his chin upwards as he spoke. He would not allow either a Frenchman or a seaman to guess at his despair. Aye, aye, sir, said Matthews. The Marie Gallant carried a boat on chocks abaft the mainmast. At Matthews' summons, the men abandoned their work on the cargo and hurried to the business of putting food and water in her. Beg your pardon, sir, said, Ho or, uh, said Hunter. But you, but you ought to see you have warm clothes, sir. I've been in an open boat for ten days once, sir. Thank you, Hunter, said Hornblower. There was much to think of. Navigating instruments, charts, compass. Would he be able to get a good observation with his sextant in a tossing little boat? Common prudence dictate that they should have all the food and water with them the boat could carry. But, and Hornblower eyed the wretched craft dubiously, seventeen men would fill it to overflowing anyway. He would have to leave much to the judgment of the French captain and of Matthews. The tackles were manned, and the boat was swayed up from the chocks and lowered into the water in the tiny lee afforded on the lee quarter. The Marie Gallant put her nose into a wave, refusing to rise to it. Green water came over the starboard bow and poured aft along the deck before a sudden wallow on the part of the brig sent it into the scuppers. There was not much time to spare. A rending crash from below told that the cargo was still swelling and forcing the bulkheads. There was a panic among the Frenchmen, who began to tumble down onto the boat with loud cries. The French captain took one look at Hornblower and then followed them. Two of the British seamen were already over the side fending the boat. Go along, said Hornblower to Matthews and Carson, who still lingered. He was the captain. It was his place to leave the ship last. So waterlogged was the brig now that it was not at all difficult to step down from the uh, fr into the boat from the deck. The British seamen were in the stern sheets and made room for him. Take the tiller, Matthews, said Hornblower. He did not feel he was competent enough to handle that overloaded boat. Shove off there! The boat and the brig parted company. The Marie Gallant, with her helm lashed, poked her nose into the wind and hung there. She had acquired a sudden a sudden list with the starboard side scuppers nearly under water. Another wave broke over her deck, pouring up to the open hatchway. Now she righted herself, her deck nearly level with the sea, and then she sank on an even keel, the water closing over her, her mast slowly disappearing. For an instant, her sails even gleamed under the green water. She's gone, said Matthews. Hornblower watched the disappearance of his first command. The Marie Gallant had been entrusted to him to bring into port, and he had failed. Failed on his first independent mission. He looked very hard at the setting sun, hoping that nobody would notice the tears that were filling his eyes.